Hi, this is Charlie Palmer, and you are listening to So Booking Cool. Welcome to So Booking Cool. It's Joel B. In this episode, I chat with an award-winning fine artist of 35 years. He's also an illustrator and award-winning lecturer. His work has been commissioned by the likes of the 1996 Olympics, the McDonald's Corporation, the Coca-Cola Company, the Green Bay Packers, Maya Angelou's estate before being auctioned by Swan Gallery, Howard University, Fisk University, and Vanderbilt University, just to name a few. In 2017, he began his venture into children's books, including Mama Africa, How Miriam Makiba Spread Hope With Her Song, which won the Coretta Scott King John Steptoe Award for New Talent. He also illustrated the new book, My Rainy Day Rocket Ship by Marquette Shepard. Here with us today, he is Charlie Palmer. Stay tuned for our conversation right here only on So Booking Cool. So Charlie, hi. hi, Charlie. Yes, yeah, so, and as I mentioned, with Mama Africa, you won the Coretta Scott King Award for that. That's correct. That book. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it came as a total surprise. Uh, and, and as well as an honor, um, but I, you know, I had never paid any real attention to children books and even the idea of getting awards. So to receive that um, again was a total surprise. But it was, um, it was, it was, it was special. Very, very special. Hmm. So I want to know when did you feel like becoming an artist was your calling? Would you say that it is your calling? Like, is that something that you still feel like? And when did you first receive that call? You know, it's it's very much like, and it's like like when you're saying that call is it's, it's very much like um, a, a form of ministry. You know, it's like you you mm-hmm. recognize that we're all here on this earth for a reason. And fortunately, like because I discover all the time when I'm talking to people that people haven't found their reason yet. But uh, for me, it's like very early. I just knew this is what I was supposed to do, and so my focus was to do the do it to the best of my ability. And so um, I think by I, I think I didn't take it very seriously seriously at the age of four or five, uh, only because I had you know uh, the other siblings that were drawing because everybody in my family liked to draw and paint, and so I didn't think it was something that was special to me until I got a little bit older and knew I lived to paint to draw, and I knew that was not the same in my family and even those around me. So I think it took a while for me to realize this is why I'm here. Wow. So out of your family, who, who else has gone on to pursue art professionally? Or none was it more? Them. None, none of them. Okay. Yeah. See, that's where like, the difference was. It's like we all could draw and, and everything, but no one committed to it as I did. You know, because like, I have, like I, I tell people all the time, I had a, a little brother that was two years younger than me that in high school could draw circles around me. Uh, but he was also an athlete, and so that was just one of the things that he liked doing. And I liked other things, but I I loved drawing. And what did you find that you liked to draw? Was it people? Was it animals? Um, it's always been a, a focus on people in particular, you know, not even necessarily portraits, but uh, just I, I, I've always enjoyed drawing, painting, trying to get likenesses, but also you know, di- different figures, different forms, different positions. Those things have always fascinated me. Mm-hmm. So as a child, what were, what were all the tools that you started illustrating with? And did you have a preference? See, I mean, that's, that's a very good question. But coming from a, like a humble beginning, whatever I could get my hands on. And so um, my mom, being a single mother at the time, could bring typing paper from work and would she could not bring enough typing paper for me because I was going through it so quickly. But pretty much a typing paper and a number two pencil is where I started. Mm-hmm. I didn't get really serious about different mediums until high school. And um, I, I think it was my junior year of high school when I started taking more like concentrated art courses. Prior to that, it was art here and there, but it wasn't something I even thought about pursuing on any kind of serious level but in high school my junior year is when i started saying i really want to do this what can i work where can i go with this Mm -hmm. very interesting so why was art prior to high school something that you were maybe interested in here and there and what was the turning point for high school for you to say you know what i want to i want to become more serious about this 
I, I think a lot of it comes from a cu cultural standpoint and the availability of, you know, like classes, um, you know, being the fact that we were in it, I was in a neighborhood that they didn't have like art schools. Um, they didn't have really art classes. The, the early, I had an early um, exposure to an art class, but it was a situation that didn't come, turn out very inspiring to me. Um, and I think part of it had something to do with race. And the idea that I was in an environment where I had a scholarship to go to a place that I was the only black kid. And because I was that one black child, I was uh, disregarded and ignored. And that hurt. Um, so I didn't take it seriously and start to want to do more with it until I encountered a teacher in my junior year of high school that saw, not only saw the talent that I had, but challenged me with it. Uh, she pushed me further and she would not take uh, a mediocre attempt. And, uh, it, and I didn't even understand that at the time because I kept wondering, why does this lady not like me? And then I began to say, wait a minute, she, I think she really likes me. And I think she sees something that I refuse to address myself. And so it was my junior year of high school and I was around a lot of other very talented artists at the time. And so even today, I always say, surround yourself with people that are better than you because it'll take you to another level. But being around these very creative people that are, you know, about my same age, but some of them may have had more art exposure, took me to another level. Wow. Oh, that is powerful. So, Charlie, when you were able to find, when you were able to find that community of other creatives and artists like yourself, did you find that any of them could relate to some of what you have experience with being you know disregarded and and nobody was really trying to, to mentor you or, or give a hand or help you out i you know i didn't I, then that's, that's, that becomes another step too i didn't really discover that kind of thing in a community until probably i was done with college you know we, i mm -hmm. went to art school um mm -hmm. we all painted we drew there i was again a private college where i was one of the few black people in the school by excel uh, but I think it came, it came from this innate, deep within me spirit that drove me to be better. And not better than anybody around me, but better than I'm doing at this current time. I mean, that, that's what motivates me even to this day, is that I want to do better. And so I keep pushing myself to uh, almost, almost um, to impress myself. And I'm like, I keep looking to, to do something that wows me. And I know that th through my journey, I've done a lot of work that has been very strong, but I still say I can do better. And that, that's all in, internal. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you just tell us more about that? Like, what, what does it look like to say that, okay, I want to be better? I know you mentioned, like, you want to wow yourself, but what, what, is the de what are the details of that? I'm, I'm, when it comes to painting, and, and for me, I, I spend so much time in my studio. I mean, I paint a lot, um, and but it's a driving force for, for me because um, I think there, you know, like I, I'm driven to create a masterpiece, and I've not done that yet. And so my desire is before I leave this earth is to create a masterpiece, and so that's kind of the driving force because I have a vision in my mind of what this piece, whatever piece I'm working on, is going to look like. And I've never felt like I've ever reached what that vision was. But instead of scratching it out or covering it up, I move on to the next one because I know that what I produce is a strong piece of art. And on many levels, a, a piece that will sp like in inspire others, move others. But for me, it's like it wasn't what I saw in my head. So I'm going to keep digging until I pull out something that absolutely wows me and I can say this is a masterpiece. And I, I say all the time, I've said it to people, it's like, you know what, but I hope that that doesn't happen until I'm like on my deathbed. Because a lot of times when you get to that point where you've created the best you absolutely can, where do you go from there? You know, so that driving force is to keep creating until I create something absolutely great. But if I ever do that, then there'll be no reason to do this anymore. So I'm okay with doing that for the rest of my life until I can get there. So do you have a muse? Is it, is it something in particular? Or does your muse ever change? Is it like driven by phases? Uh, my muse has 
always been black people. Mm -hmm. And in particular, like black children. Black children make me smile. Uh, black children inspire me. Um, um, black, black children give me a reason. You know, I want to, there's a delight in these children um, that I'm trying to capture on canvas. Uh, but then it's bigger than that is black people. You know, I've spent so much time in my life as an artist, you know, telling our story as black folks in our journey to get somewhere, to be acknowledged, to be recognized for what we already are. And so I'm, I'm working, I've always been working on that. And so a lot of what I did had to do with, you know, historically, the, uh, fr from, from Africa through the Middle Passage to uh, here uh, to, you know, America and through slavery and then, uh, you know, uh, freedom and reconstruction and the civil rights movement. And it's been this historical thing that has driven me because it's like, I don't want this story to ever get away. I don't think we should ever forget this. And so I painted that and painted that and painted that for a long time. And then it became more social political where I painted a lot because I was trying to let people know about what's going on out there. And so even with that, it was like, at some point I'm like, not as redundant, but perhaps I need to focus my energy and shift it a little bit to the fact that stop like preaching to the choir and start celebrating our blackness. And so I began to, you know, paint like my introvert series first was personal, but then it became bigger than that. It's about beauty and how beautiful we are as black people in our existence. It's not even a, a tie to or attached to our accomplishments. They're so, they're, they're unlimited. What we've accomplished and what we continue to accomplish is something that we could never cover. But the idea that just in our existence, we are powerful and we are beautiful. And so that's been my focus like for the last maybe two, three years of just celebrating be the beauty of blackness. And would you say you first found the beauty of blackness in illustration um, as a child with the Snowy Day book by Ezra Jack Keats? Absolutely. That's funny. You've been doing some research on me, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. You know, see, <clears throat> so, so with, with the snowy, with snowy day, it was the. I didn't, I didn't realize at the time because I was like five or six years old. But like looking at this book, I saw me, and it was the first time I realized I'd ever seen me, you know, represented somewhere and represented in a, a positive light, and a way that again acknowledges that you're okay. And so like, I would look at that book over and over again, and it was before I could actually read the book that I kind of kept going back to this book and it moved me. And then looking at the mother that's in that book, and it looked like my mother. She wasn't that thin June Cleaver kind of woman. She was this beautiful black heavyset woman with big hips and tiny waist and I mean, tiny ankles and tiny wrists, but that was my mama. And so I saw that and I'm like, I, I, don't, I, I was gravitated to it and didn't even realize until 30 years later, going back to it and seeing it again and saying that was the catalyst to take me somewhere to, um, to want to celebrate, to acknowledge us in any way I could. And the thing that always intrigued me is for the last 25 years, I've collected children's books and I've always collected, I would say, children books of color with a focus almost on you know, African-American authors and African-American illustrators. Wow. What is something that you would have wanted to have said to Ezra Jack Keats or asked? You know, what I would have said without a doubt uh, and no hesitation, thank you. Um, that would be the first thing because he saw something, he recognized something that even to this day, I don't think the publishing companies totally understand is that we are here, we're here to stay, and we need to be represented. And not only do we need to be represented, but we need, we need to be represented in a positive light. We need to be represented in a way that is not the stereotype, because there are like, like not that I want to say that, like, like that historical books aren't relevant and important, because uh, they are, um, like, like what I'm seeing now, a, a trend is the celebration 
of the texture of our hair. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it really is that our children are as creative and as amazing and wonderful and intellig as intelligent as any other child out there. And so why not tell the story when it has nothing to do with our, our color, but simply a child being, but that child is a black child. So you said that you've been collecting children, black children's books with the focus of black children's books and characters written by black authors and illustrated by black artists. You've been doing that for 25 years, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah at least 25 years. Yeah. Wow, wow. So, so, so when the opportunity came, like, for example, to do Mama Africa, yes. it, it was like they came to me. You know, I, I acknowledge my ancestors, and my ancestors have always directed amazing projects to me. They came to me with a, a great budget with a concept that it was like, oh, I know Mariam McKeever. I don't know a lot about her. I knew her music, but it was like, yeah. And then it was like, we're, we're going to give you time and we're going to give you a decent amount of money to do it. And like, these are all dreams. And so it was like, absolutely, I'm aboard. Yeah, I was, I'm glad you said that because I was going to ask like how, what draws you to a project and you know, how, how does it happen and everything? How do yeah, you do it's like, can I wrap my mind, can I wrap my heart around it? You know, because uh, money can be an incentive for some people, but there are lots of things that I will turn down because I'm not moved by it. Or I don't think I can give my, my soul or my spirit to it. But I'm, I'm looking at that book. When I read that manuscript, it's like I can relate to it. Or I want to know more about this. And so, like, like you know, like, it's as simple as, like um, um, it's like rainy day, rainy day rocket ship, for example. It's like it was. It reminded me. It was. It was a book, and I, I'm t right now it escapes me. But it was like this idea of imagination, and how creative the imagination can be, and how entertaining the the imagination can be. And so this uh, this is like, and I'm just thinking about it. As I'm talking to you right now. This is not a story about a black child. This is about a child who's stuck at home. And, you know, their parents are, parents are almost encouraging this young man, find something creative to do with your day. And so he comes up with this whole idea the, to create a rocket ship with a little bit of aid from his mom and his dad to create this rocket ship and take a flight to a different place. And it's like, so I saw it right away. It's like, oh, I can see this child. I, I know exactly what he looks like. And it was funny because, like, with a lot of my works, I immediately sketch out something when I read the manuscript. And then I start imagining what this child looks like or this character looks like. And this actually like Mary Makiba, what did she look like as a little girl? But then I have to bring in a photographer to shoot a couple of photographs, different angles and everything. But I, I initially, I went to my son, my oldest son, his name is Giovanni. And I went and asked if I could use my grandson which is my second male um, grandson. Uh, he, he had an older brother who was too big for the character. But I only needed and wanted to use him for his body because I, what the kid looked like to me was different than my grandson, but his body type and everything was perfect. But then mm. I didn't realize until everything was done that the little boy that I had actually created uh, is my nephew. And I, I, my, after it was painted and submitted and everything, I look at a couple of images and I'm like, my, my, my nephew, his name is uh, Hudson. Mm -hmm. And Hudson is kind of like, because Hudson's one of my few relatives that are here in Atlanta, Georgia. And so he's more like my grandson than, than like, really like a nephew uh, because he's with me all the time. And his grandfather, which is my uncle, passed away. And so he knows me more like as a grandfather than he, he never got to really know his, his grandfather. And so I looked at the little boy after I was done and said, that, that's Hudson. And I, I created it without being aware that I did. Oh, wow. Once you were able to, to make that connection, how did, how did that feel? You know, everything in my journey, I have to pause because when you're in it, you're not aware of it. But when you pause and you look at it, it's like, listen to the spirit. The spirit is always there. The spirit is always directing you, aiding you, protecting you. And so you just have to pause. Like, I, I, I believe and I would hope that a lot of people right now, because 
they're forced to be still, will look around them and recognize their blessings. You know, I mean, like when you get beyond the concerns of everyday survival, you know, like you start looking at like people are re-examining their careers, what direction they want to go and what they want to do next. But it's like when I kind of like look at things that are going on with me, I begin to recognize over and over again that they've been there to direct me. They've been there to say, even when it's come artistically, like do that. And whatever that is, I am in it. And when I step back, I realize, okay, that wasn't me. That was bigger than me. Yeah. So going back to what you said too, yeah, that you listen to the ancestors, like you're very connected to our ancestors and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that that is the same as listening and trusting the universe? Is that the same? Oh, absolutely. They're, they're one and the same. You know, when I talk about like the like the, the ancestors, mm -hmm. I realize <clears throat> that, oh, oh, universe. Universe is a really good, like, and, and if you see like everything that I've been doing for the last three or four months, it's all about the universe. But why is it about the universe? It's like what, what happened was uh, my partner and I spent the, uh, the month of February in South Africa. Uh, just chilling out, relaxing. She's a writer. I'm a painter, and uh, I was trying to learn a electronic, a computer program, so I could illustrate remote. But while I was there, you know, we were exposed to just the great people that we. You know, this is you know, we've made several trips there, but this is one of the times we were going to be still. But while we were there, we went to a couple of art shows and an art museum and things like this. And I said to her at one point, "It's like you know what? Maybe the next thing for me to do." is to start thinking globally, globally and more universal. And I like, but I don't know exactly what that means. And then from that, I, um, I had an ex a spiritual advisor that I sat down with and had a reading and uh, like a go-go, a go-go. And she was beginning to tell me certain things about my journey and how the ancestors have directed me. But then I realized in that conversation and and the conversations or the interaction I had with her and then the, the conversations I had with my partner that black is universal, you know? So it's like, it doesn't mean I have to depart from anything I'm doing. If anything, I expand on the idea of black being universal. And so the universe is very much a part of that. That is deep. Yeah. I mean, everything, honestly, that you're saying is very deep and true so resonant. Are there any misconceptions about artists? <laughs> you know, uh, the first thought <laughs> came to mind is like, yeah, they were cool people. No, we're not. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're interesting. We're odd. Um, misconceptions. Um, yeah, I think a lot of times it's there's a misconception that we're not very intelligent. Mm -hmm. that we're artsy, we dismiss this as, um, you know, like not serious thinkers. And most of the artists that are around me are very intelligent, well-read, very creative, but pretty amazing people. So, I mean, and I'm not really speaking for myself. I don't know about myself, but I think that those that are around me are very informed, intelligent people. And so I think if anything, we're not flighty and uh, misinformed. We're very informed because our work shows that we're informed. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would think. I can't imagine why somebody would try to say otherwise about artists. Yeah, it's just missed all the time. Like, oh, he's an artist, so he's going to be a little different. He, you know, it's like, no, um, it's, there's more to us. Oh, yeah, I, I see. I see what you're saying. Like, you're, they're judging like artists by their intelligence and personality and even in some cases you know people who go to the arts even if we're talking about music or film um that sometimes that career path is judged yet society we we praise and we are very deeply inspired and moved by artists so i've, I've never been able to understand that what, what's your take right yeah i mean i, I agree i agree um we 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 inform the world on so many different levels. And like when I say that, I, I'm not even, I'm talking artists. So then I'm talking like musicians and I'm talking, um, you know, uh, writers, writers particularly. 
mm -hmm. um, visual artists, dancers. We, we have a story to tell, and it's a story that informs a lot of what everybody's doing. You know, fashion designers, you know, that's artistic as well, but it's like all these kinds of things. We determine what this world looks like, and at times how this world might think. Or at least we, if, if we're digging deep enough, we're gonna give people pause to really re-examine some of their ideas and thoughts. That's why it's like a lot of times that, like I'm seeing a series of pieces that people are doing lately with, um, with the face mask. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know unless I can interpret that in some kind of creative way if I would ever do a painting with a face mask, but it's making a statement and it's saying something right now about the condition and environment that we're currently living in. Mm -hmm. And I know that you like to, well, do you still like to ask questions, not necessarily find answers, but ask questions with your, with your art? I think it's, it's, it's yes. Uh, I think it's a safe approach, you know, because I don't, I don't want to ever present myself as knowing. Um, I want to approach most things with the question and perhaps get as much feedback from viewers as to how they interpret something. And so I, I think it very much is posing the question and, and that's what the work is and then seeing what kind of reaction or response I get. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's often the answer. How does it feel when you're receiving the feedback for your work? Um, many times it, it's, I feel a lot of gratitude. Uh, there are, I mean, that's not always the case. I mean, like, there are times when I do not agree or um, might be offended, might be insulted by the reaction. Uh, I do at times try to clarify if I feel there's been a misunderstanding. But then sometimes I also accept that the, the viewers is bringing their own experience to anything. So if they react or respond a certain way to something that has been created visually, that they're, they're totally entitled to that. So I don't think it's necessarily a right or a wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would only attempt to defend that if they're suggesting that I'm wrong. But I'm more about the idea that perhaps there's more than one answer to this. And so I'm open to that. And tell us about your alter ego, Carlos, and, and the story behind that. Okay, so the thing about Carlos, Carlos um, was a, a catalyst to give me a certain amount of freedom in what I was doing. Um, Carlos is somebody that I created 15 years ago. But what it was was this idea that I, my career had started and I started to get some attention and I wanted to explore different directions. And a lot of times people, you know, it's like the, the overused term today for what people are doing is branding. And so I've created this brand and now people are responding positively to that brand, but I don't want to do that anymore. I want to try something different. And so, um, the idea of Carlos came when I was in, um, I think I was in Cancun and I was in a cab and the cab driver asked me my name. And I said, Charlie, and he says, Oh, Carlos. And I'm like, Oh, I like Carlos. I like that name. And so I was like, you know what? Let me use Carlos as the, e the alter ego to explore a different approach to this thing, meaning art. And perhaps he would be more carefree, more abstract and loose using more palette, using bolder, brighter colors. And so I started to continue to do what I had been doing because my fine art career had started. But I also let people know I did not try to hide behind Carlos. I just let, it, let them know that this is another side of me, another persona. And so explored both. I kept continuing to do what I had been doing. And at the same time doing the work that was more Carlos abstract, looser. And, um, and then I found myself after a few years of doing it, the two personalities, the personas diverged, you know, or, you know, emerged, they emerged into something as an individual. And I realized there was no reason to sign Carlos to anything anymore because Charlie and Carlos were now one and the same creatively. Wow. They're now one, one and the same now. Yeah. And that's, that, that, that was about 10 yeah. years ago. They, 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 they merged. Was that a goal of yours or it just happened organically, would you say? Very much organic. 
uh, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I, but I enjoyed the idea of not knowing, which is kind of scary for some people. They want that control. They want to know what's next. And a lot of times, even when it comes creatively, like I'm really compelled right now to explore a couple of abstracts. Abstracts are some of the most difficult and at the same time fun things to do because you, you have no idea what you're doing until it's done. And, and does every illustration begin with a sketch? Is that you know, like, see, I've been doing this for so long. Yeah. That, that even when I teach, I tell young people in the beginning, sketch it out first, work out what we are called, what we call thumbnails. And thumbnails are just very loose. It's like, like a rough draft. Uh, if you're writing, but it's the rough idea of what you want to do so that you're not wasting canvas and wasting time painting something larger scale that may not in the end be worth it. Mm. And so um, when I'm doing children books and things like that, absolutely I'm doing a lot of uh, thumbnail sketches and then tighter sketches. Uh, when I'm doing paintings, because I've been doing this now for 35 years or so, I can pretty much see how something's going to be placed and everything on a canvas. So I don't do sketches unless it's a little bit more complex. Or perhaps it's a commission piece and I want to show the client ultimately like what it's going to roughly look like on that page, then I'll do a sketch. So what do you think that this is with even despite like how horrible like this time is in terms of the deaths and the, the illnesses and everything of the COVID, do you think that this is a good time for creatives if they are able to, to take advantage of this time? Yeah, yes and no. It, like, and I say no only because there were several times when I went into my studio, because my, my, that's my escape. Uh, that's my second home um, in many ways. And I, go, I would go in and I couldn't create. And it was that I was distracted. I, I don't create, like some people, writers and artists, their most creative stuff comes when they're struggling through a lot of emotional things. And it's an outlet for them. But I find that I create best when I'm at peace and when I'm feeling good. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I found myself going in and spending a whole day not able to really create because there was too many things on my mind and in my heart. Even the idea that I had created almost a haven for other artists in my studio. And so I have like a little basketball game thing that you, you can throw basketballs around. I have a video game. I have two couches and chairs and all this. I have like a refrigerator. I have a community bag, of, you know, like with packages of chips and water and juice. I have all these things I've created as part of my escape, but for others as well. And suddenly I had to shut the door and put a sign saying, I'm not receiving guests. And I've literally had several occasions where I've like talked to people through the door, through the door crack, and that doesn't feel good. And also like, um, it took me a moment to get to a point where I was also not feeling guilty about the idea that I'm isolating myself because I'm, I'm protecting them and I'm protecting myself. But sometimes people don't see it that way and people feelings are going to be hurt. And there might be a lot of mending that we're going to have to do after this is over with because people are feeling as if they're being punished for this. And so it's those kinds of things that I'm dealing with. That's real. Wow. I, who could not imagine that, um, that they don't understand why you have had to kind of have a bit of a barrier, a barrier, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, you, if you think about it, it was like, like, especially people like, like I, I, a friend of mine who's also my videographer, um, she said, I'm very touchy feeling. She's very huggy. She loves to hug and everything. We're friends. Mm -hmm. And um, she's saying that this is killing me. She said, it's like, I, every time I see one of my friends, I want to hug them. I know I got to keep with distance. She said, I saw a beautiful little baby the other day when I was grocery shopping and I smiled and I realized that child can't see my smile. And it's like so those, those things that uh, we feed off of sometimes because when we give that smile, many times it's returned to us and that's, that warms the heart. That makes you feel good. But you're mm -hmm. in this you know, situation where like, like uh, uh, again, like well, my partner and I, because of the area we live in, we like to walk a lot. And we've noticed that 
now is even that people aren't even making eye contact. And so I jokingly said to her one one day while we were out there, it's like it was so weird. I'm like, did we miss the memo? Can you get this virus by making eye contact? This is getting really to a point where we're starting to really distance ourselves from one another. You know, so that's going to be something that we're gonna to have to come back from. And the world that we know after will probably be very different. That is so true. I mean, what your friend said too about the hugging. Yeah. The said the simplest things, yeah. That maybe people have not necessarily taken it for granted, but in a way you kind of feel like that now, like, wow, you know, being able to do something as hug and, and smile at people. Mm -hmm. And this and you you have your own studio, correct? That right. you're speaking of, your own studio. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm in a building with several other artists. Right. We, have, we, have, we have musicians and, and, and photographers and several artists in this building. And we, we have kind of a community. And in fact, there were many a days I'd leave my door wide open. The, the, the main door, I have a main door that enters into my studio from the parking lot. But then I have a door that opens up into the building. And I would leave that door open so that people could come and go. And now it's not only closed, but it's closed and locked. Do you think that there's a way for artists to connect virtually? I mean, it's not the same as in person, but what, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I'm doing actually like a, a studio tour next week, uh, bringing my vi videographer back in again and walking him through, talking him through uh, my studio. And then I also have a, a lecture. I had a two part. I, I, I received a major award through UCLA as a lecturer this year. Oh. Um, and, and it was a two part presentation. And uh, it's a rare, it's, it's, one, it's one that every year, it's called a region award. And UCLA gives it out to one speaker like every year. And each department has to submit a proposal. And this is the first time that UCLA's African American Studies Department has received this award. And it was given to me. And so I got a chance to go in and talk to the students about whatever I know, uh, which was fun, but it was a two part. And I've done the first part, but the second part, I actually had a meeting yesterday. That's where the confusion came in with our meeting was that um, I'm supposed to be doing the second part like virtual because there's no way that anybody's getting on a flight or anything like that. So it's, it's a way to, um, to still make a connection, um, but it is virtual and the virtu virtual it's not the same, but it is at least a way to say, hey, in, in a way it's a way to say I'm still here and I'm still creating and I'm still thinking about you. I still have things in which I can share with you. And I'm watching people in very creative ways do that, which is kind of like, you know, find out a creative way to kind of still make that contact, but it's, it's not the same. You know, congratulations on the award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Yeah, what would you say are the proudest moments of your career? That's, that is so good. Um, because of how I approach this whole experience, um, it's so hard to answer that question because I, I, I really don't know like, again, like when my partner looks at me crazy sometimes because some pretty amazing things might happen to me. And there's like little or no reaction at all. And it is like, I look at like, like, like this is an example. When these great things, like something just happened to me that literally has to do with the fact that uh, we're being kept inside, self-isolation and everything. And it was something that may not have happened had this not happened where I'm doing this big project because I can do this without having to bring in a whole team. And so it was like, wow, this is major. This is something that will be globally recognized. And it's like, this happened because of this. This is really fascinating. But I'm in the end part of it and finishing it off. And it's like, for me, it's not even official until it becomes official. And like all the work on my end for the most part has been done. But until they make an official announcement and they show it to someone or anything like that, it um, it's not official to me. So, like when I think about my greatest accomplishment, I hear people say like my children, but um, I I really 
it's really because I'm always looking for that, that next thing. And when that great thing happens to me, it's like, okay, that was really great. What's next? And I, I really don't, I, I, it's really difficult for me to, to, to answer that. I mean, but I, but I absolutely love that you asked it because it's like, I have to keep examining because there are probably many things that I've accomplished that people dream of. But mm-hmm. I'm still looking for the next thing and the next thing. Because as long as I'm here, I'll be looking for the next thing. Um, and like, I think that the idea and, and I did, I mean, the reality that I can make a living at this. Because um, when I talk to young people, and I, I very much believe in the idea of passing it forward, how can I give my gift or share my gift with other people? And at least let them know that what I've accomplished, I promise you, you can accomplish because I've come from as humble beginning, beginning as you have. If you knew my story, you would know that, you know, it, it has been a challenge, but I kind of like do that. I, I, I like to go to them, but whenever I go talk to young people, the first thing I, I say is find something that you enjoy doing and you'll never have to work a day in your life. And that's what I do. I'm like, I can't believe people pay me to do what I do. So I, I think if I was to say that, it was, I guess, to be able to create something that I can make a living at that I absolutely love doing. That's a major accomplishment for me because I know 90% of the people out there are not doing that. Yeah. You know, when you, with you saying that you, you're not quite sure what, what it is yet, that accomplishment that most stands out to you, it does take me back to what you were saying earlier about you feel like you have not, despite your incredible um, work and, you know, your work, the fact that it's been revered, you feel like you have not created your masterpiece yet. So to me, when you were saying that, it took me back to that. Like, and that's you, part of it, mm-hmm. you know. But, you know, even if, like, I guess that would be, like, self-gratification. but if that masterpiece was to be acknowledged by the world or by uh, the city of Atlanta, then perhaps I'm like, okay, it wasn't just in my mind. It really is a masterpiece. But if I say I've done that masterpiece and everybody say, it's a high, then it's like, oh, okay, let's start over again. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, and, and also with what you said, what you tell young people, find something that you enjoy. And you'll never have to work a day in your life. So how do you feel? Do you feel like everyone should pursue a passion or something that they're very, very interested in? Because I I personally believe, it's not about me, but I personally believe in that. I have heard some people say that some things are, it's fine as a hobby. And sometimes mm-hmm. it, it puts pressure on some people to to go after what they want when it, everyone's situation is not like that. So how do you how do you feel about that? Um, I I'm convinced that every individual that's created and brought on this earth is here for a purpose. And so with that in mind, you have to find your purpose. And I think that if you found your purpose, then that thing I'm talking about as far as finding something that you enjoy doing, I think that you get to live a life, even of contentment. Some people aren't even content. You know what I mean? Others are overjoyed. You know, overjoyed with their experiences and what they're doing, but there are certain people that just every day go to a job that they absolutely hate or are doing something that they don't enjoy doing. But I think that everybody has it, and I think it's so important to not only find that gift, because then you can connect to your passion. Um, But I think we are all here for a reason. And I I believe I found my reason. So what, what do you want people to take away from the children's books? You know, my rainy day rocket ship by the, by the awesome Marquette Shepherd, that's going to be coming out with, with, in which you are the illustrator for that. And then also is there, there's a dragon in my closet. Mm -hmm. Is that being re-released? Yeah, I'll say so. Simon and Schuster uh, is re releasing uh, There's a Dragon in My Closet, mm-hmm. which I co wrote and co illustrated. Mostly, most of the illustrations are mine uh, with a partner of mine 15 years ago initially. And then um, uh, Deneen Milner or Milner Books uh, through Agate originally 
published it. But then uh, when the name moved over to Simon & Schuster, she took that along with it. And Simon & Schuster was like, absolutely. And so they republished it. And that was one of those, um, those again, stories, because it's the whole idea of the whimsical, wonderful imagination that a lot of kids have. And we really need to nurture, nurture and encourage. And it really is not about a black kid. It's about a kid who discovers a dragon in his closet. And so it's like that idea of telling that kind of story, I think is like essential to imagination. I heard a long time ago, I think it was my grandmother who said it. And she, she said that if you're bored, it just means that you're lacking creativity. And I was like, yeah, because if you're a creator, you, you should never be bored. There's too many creative things you can do. And it doesn't require extra equipment or expensive equipment. It takes anything. I, I, and so I'm thinking about like, like Rainy Day Rocket Ship, what it reminded me of is as a child, when we would play like with my brothers, that our, our bed was a, a ship and the floor was shark infest, infested river or shark infested ocean, right? And that you couldn't fall off the bed because if you did, the, the sharks would eat you up. And we would literally get into a, at a point where like if you fell off the bed, you would literally panic because the sharks would get you. And it was like mm -hmm. imagination. That's all it takes. So like dragging in the closet is one of those kind of things. Like, like and I asked, or I've had that conversation with somebody before, does that dragon really exist? And someone said to me, I don't think it does. And I, I said to them, I really think it does. And so like with Rainy Day Rocket Ship, in the end, that story becomes really about it really is about how can I encourage my child to have an imagination? How can we have a full day where he's not whining and complaining? And in the end, how can I wear this child out so he will fall asleep easily? And all of that happens in the story. Yeah, it, yes, it does. Yes, it does. So do you think that it is going to be inspiring and entertaining and engaging for families in general, but also perhaps other children's books, writers and illustrators? I would hope so. You know, I mean, like, as a fine artist, and as, a, as a, book, a book illustrator, I never know what people are going to respond to. I know, I know what I respond to, and I think that's how I approach everything. I don't respond, like, I look at something and say, oh, this is going to be a number one seller. You know, or this painting. Everybody's going to want this painting because I am so wrong sometimes. Even when it comes to like, like, like when I'm doing an art show, I don't pick the art that's gonna go in the show. I have my gallerist pick what's gonna go in the show because if they tell me, okay, what's your best piece? I'm like, I don't know. I know what piece I like the most, but that may not be the one that people in general are gonna to respond to. Mm -hmm. And I like, like the, I have an exhibit going on right now in New Orleans, uh, which is pretty much shut down. But when I was working on this, I had been working a whole year to prepare for this show. And I was at an event two weeks before I had to ship out. And I encountered a woman with, with Bantu knots in her hair. And when I saw her, it was like, oh my God, I got to paint that. And so I run up to the lady and I take pictures. I'm like, I got to paint this. And then I go to the gallery and say, I need, give me another, like an extra week so that I can finish this one painting. And I believe it's the first painting that sold in the show. But it was one of those wow. emotional things that you respond to and it's bigger than me. So is that part of your process? You take the photograph, you take a picture and then you, you replicate that? Uh, it, it, it depends. Sometimes it, it, it goes that way where I'm like, I have an idea and I'll take a photograph. Sometimes I'll see a photograph that inspire something that I want to explore. Uh, I could be watching TV and all of a sudden I hear something and I say, oh, I got an idea. It's, it's everywhere and it's always going on. Uh, it's at times difficult to turn it all off. And speaking of like replicating, because I, wa I want to know, like as, as an artist, as an illustrator, when you're illustrating a specific character for a series, like such as the Ava Murray series, mm -hmm. that how do you make sure that everything is the exact same? You, you know what I mean? Like the exact 
same, the character looks the exact same from the first book to the next book. It's very helpful when you have a model. I mean, it really is that easy. Like if you're always working from the same model, it's easy. Uh, otherwise, I, I wouldn't even know how to approach it. Like my only like challenge, like with that particular series that you just mentioned, is I saw the little girl that was the original model for the the uh, the, the series, and she's getting older. So it's like, uh, like y'all gonna need to kind of decide if there's gonna be more of this series real soon because she's growing up and she's not gonna look like she's not gonna look the same in a few years. Is so? Do you think in the case you would have to depend on the photographs of her when she's a certain age yeah there, i'd have to keep a lot of good photographs just in the future in case mm. you know something else comes up or this keeps expanding so that i'll have reference of that person's face at that age okay. and and kids grow so quickly yeah you know they really do they they grow quickly they change right mm-hmm so what, what are some challenges, because you've mentioned some of them throughout our conversation, that you have had to overcome that you would caution artists right now of? Okay, so again, coming from a, a genuine, like, honest place, the first two things, and they're, they're, they're the same and they're different, is like being overly confident. I'm overly confident means that you're not going to grow as a creative person but being so insecure that you hold yourself back. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's like there are times that people are really good. Humility is wonderful and it's healthy. So being cocky and arrogant can be really, I've seen in the time I've been in Atlanta 20 something years, I've seen people that I've, that I've approached or have approached me who seem overly confident. And so they think they're at a certain level. And if they think they're there, They'll never get better, you know, but then also don't have doubt hold you back from taking on the world. You know, I would, I would prefer to encounter somebody who's overly confident because they might accomplish it as opposed to someone who insecurity is going to keep them from even trying to attempt to live their dreams. Mm, wow, that's extremely sound. Do you think that that's easy advice for, for people to, to follow? Most advice is not easy. You know what I mean? Uh, in fact, advice is easy to give, but it's not easy to live. Right. Yeah. Because I, I, I say that, and like, like when I had my experience with my go-go spiritual advisors in, in, in South Africa, she kept going back to uh, um, insecurities. And at one point, I'm like, okay, why do you keep going back to this insecurity thing? And she said to me, I'm only telling you what the spirits are telling me. Because I was like getting defensive about it, I'm like, oh yeah, because I knew she was on it, and I knew she recognized. I mean, I knew she was, you know, really on point and pointing out something that I struggle with. And, and when she like kept bringing it up, I'm like, wait a minute, why do we keep going? And she said, I'm not going there. The spirits are telling me to share that with you. So I'm just thinking like that. It goes back to what you were saying about the spirits mm -hmm. and listening. Wow. I think li listening, listening, and trusting it, you know, listening. very much kind of like, cause and like a lot of times it, it's going to take you in a direction that you're not comfortable with mm -hmm. or that you may not want to go in, or that you're fearful to go in, but it's like in the end, like do it. It's like, I, I think Les Brown says like, like, and that helped me when it came to me making the move from Milwaukee, which I had a really good job in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I was about to pack up and move. Uh, to Atlanta, Georgia with no job. And I'm like, you know, I remember listening to one of his tapes and he said, I know your fear and do it anyway. And so it's like, I think if you're not afraid or a little fearful, you haven't thought this out because you're about to dive into some very deep water. But isn't it best to jump in that water and start pedaling? than to stay home and say, nah, I think I'm gonna avoid the water altogether. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd rather look at my life and say, I'm glad I jumped in that water as opposed to saying, I wonder what would have happened had I jumped in that water. Wow. And on that note, Mr. Charlie Palmer, everyone. Oh my goodness. Mr. Charlie Palmer, I, like, I could 
keep the conversation going, going. Like, thank you for taking the time and, and chatting with So Booking Cool today. It was such a thank pleasure. You. It's, it, it's been a pleasure. I mean, I hope I gave, I gave something to somebody. You know? no, oh, you definitely did. Like, yeah, for sure. Like when when people hear hear this, it's definitely going to connect with with somebody. With somebody. Yeah. <laughs> that's all. That's that's all that matter. Yes, and yes. Yeah, so the upcoming books: My Rainy Day Rocket Ship. There's a dragon in the closet, in my closet. Excuse me. There's a dragon in my closet, and then then also you have some other books coming out, right? Yeah, I have. The People of Plant is the story of uh, Nelson Mandela after he was released from uh, Roberts Island. The other one is uh, the teacher's, teacher's March, and it has to do with teachers that stood up against the uh, civil rights movement. I mean, as part of the civil rights movement uh, in uh, Alabama um, in, the, in the, uh, the late 60s. And they're both probably going to be released this summer. This summer? This summer, yes. Oh, wow. That's, that's exciting. Yeah. Okay. And what is something that you want readers to take away and, and artists, people in general, what do you want people to take away from, from your work and what do you want them to know about you? I would hope when you look at it that you know that my heart went into it and my love went into it um, and that it inspires them on some kind of level, that it reaches, reaches to you on some kind of level where you want to do, make a difference, make an impact be involved on some level. And that's what a lot of the books have to do. It's like, it, I, it, if it changes the course of your life in any kind of positive way, I would hope uh, I've, I've done something to help inspire that by those books that I created. Mr. Palmer, would you ever see yourself writing a, well, you have written before. You yeah, I cope, I cope, yeah, but I'm also work, <laughs> I'm working on another book that actually I, I, I wrote and illustrated. Uh, but, 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 I haven't even, like, I've done the initial sketches, but I haven't started painting that book yet. It's called um, uh, The Legend of Gravity. I'm sorry, The Legend of Gravity. And it has mm -hmm. to do with, it's, uh, it's honoring great basketball legends, playground legends, and some of the, the tales that we've heard about these great players. But it's kind of like acknowledging some of them because as a kid growing up, I heard a lot about some of these players. I didn't grow up in, like, New York where you saw a lot of them. Um, but it kind of inspired me, but I decided to put a little twist on it. You know. All right. Oh, that's, that is extremely exciting. Definitely will be looking forward to that. You know, um, would love to talk with you again and talk about like these future upcoming projects that you have going on. I'd love to. Okay. Anytime. I'm glad to hear that. And how can people keep up with you, stay connected, stay updated? Well, you could go to... Uh, Charlie L. Palmer at Instagram. That's probably where I'm the most active and I try to post work on a regular basis, works in progress, or like um, I, I got a special announcement that will probably be taking place that will, well, it's probably by the end of this month for sure. And it, it's pretty major, but I try to keep them posted on all the things that I'm doing there. So you go to Charlie with a Y, C-H-A-R-L-Y Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R, uh, and that's a that's a G that's a uh, IG account or Instagram. Mm hmm IG Instagram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the website is cl is real clean too. Very nice website. Yes. Thank you. And so that's www dot charlie c h a r l y palmer p a l m e r dot com. All right. Thank you again, and to Thank all you. the listeners. Till next time. So booking cool.